Hey, I'm Ben Shapiro with Reality Check. A couple of weeks ago, HBO's Bill Maher got into it with the Islamic expert and horrifyingly mediocre actor who should never, ever, 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 ever play Batman, Ben Affleck, over whether Islam was indeed a violent religion. Here's the exchange. And you're painting a br Wait, like the whole group religion with no, that. No, no, let, let's get down to who has the right answer here. A billion people, you say. All these billion people don't hold any of billion these... five or something. Don't like hold these pernicious beliefs? No, I wouldn't. Oh, well, no, they don't. Of course, he's not alone in taking the PC position that Muslims the world over are tolerant and liberal. He's joined by our president, Barack Obama. Islam teaches peace. Muslims the world over aspire to live with dignity and a sense of justice. Wow, it's just like John Lennon's Imagine. Now, the question isn't whether Islam itself is violent. It's what its adherents believe, because that's what they act upon. There's plenty of violent material in the Old and New Testaments. Hey, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I read the Old Testament a lot. But believers in those particular texts are not currently ramming airliners into towers or beheading journalists or mutilating female genitalia. So, let's examine the question. Is radicalism in the Muslim world a tiny minority phenomenon? So to answer that question, we need to define our terms. We're, we're really not talking about people who are active terrorists. Radical beliefs are a lot broader than terrorists, and anybody who argues otherwise is being naive or foolish or disingenuous. But terrorists draw their moral, financial, and religious support from those who are not terrorists themselves. So, who are the radicals? Ben Affleck actually was right on this. There are approximately 1.6 billion Muslims on the planet, and they're from 49 different countries in terms of where they have a majority. All the population stats, by the way, are from Pew Research as of 2011. Indonesia is the world's most populous Muslim country. It's got almost 205 million Muslims living there. According to one 2009 poll, it showed almost 50% of Indonesians actually support strict Sharia law, not just in Indonesia, but in a lot of countries. And 70% blamed the United States, Israel, or somebody else for 9-11. So you make that calculation, it's about 143 million people who are radicalized. You scared yet? You know, we're just getting started. Okay, Egypt, 80 million Muslims. According to that same 2009 poll, it showed that 65% want strict Sharia law in every Islamic country, and almost 70% said that they had positive or mixed feelings about bin Laden. So that's 55.2 million more radicals. Pakistan has almost 179 million Muslims. 76%, just over three quarters, want strict Sharia law in all Islamic countries. That is another 135.4 million radicals. Bangladesh, not a country you tend to think of as Muslim, but there are 149 million Muslims living there. As of 2013, just over a quarter said suicide bombings or targeting of civilians was sometimes justified. Another 82% want Sharia to be the official law of the country. And two thirds said honor killings of women can sometimes be justified. Honor killings, two thirds, it's 121.9 million radicals. Nigeria, 75.7 million Muslims live there. 71% favor Sharia law, that's 53.7 million people. Iran, 74.8 million Muslims, 83% favor implementation of Sharia law as of last year. So that's 62.1 million more radicals. Turkey has 74.7 million Muslims. And 32% this is a moderate Muslim country, probably the most moderate Muslim country. 32% said honor killings of women could actually be justified sometimes. So that's 23.9 million radical Muslims in our moderate ally, Turkey. Morocco, 32.4 million Muslims live there. Just over three quarters support Sharia law. That's 24.6 million radical Muslims in Morocco. Iraq, 31.1 million Muslims live there. 78% say honor killings of women can sometimes be justified. That amounts to 24.3 million Muslim radicals. Afghanistan, 24 million people. A huge majority, 76%, support at least occasionally, or just once in a while, honor killings of women. 99% actually want Sharia to be the law of the land. So it's like a Cuban election over there. 24 million radical Muslims over in Afghanistan. Jordan, smaller Muslim country, 6.4 million Muslims. Right now, Hamas is enjoying like a 60% approval rating. So 3.8 million radical Muslims in Jordan, which is, again, a moderate country. Palestinian areas, right? We're sending literally hundreds of millions of dollars to the Palestinian areas. We are, the American taxpayers. 4.3 million Muslims live in the Palestinian areas. 78% of those had positive or mixed feelings about bin Laden. 89% support terror attacks on our ally, Israel. 89% support Sharia law. We should give them a state, folks. That's 3.83 million radical Muslims. How about in the West? Okay, let's take it to France. France, 4.7 million Muslims live there. A 2007 poll showed 35% of French Muslims said suicide bombings could sometimes be justified. It's 1.6 million radical Muslims living in France. Great Britain, 2.8 million Muslims living there. 78% wanted cartoonists of Muhammad legally prosecuted. 
So we're talking about 2.2 million radical Muslims in Great Britain. How about here in the United States? Well, we have a very moderate Muslim population. We do. 2.6 million Muslims live here, according to Pew Research. 13% said violence against civilians can be justified. 19% said they were either favorable toward Al-Qaeda or just didn't know. You know, because who knows, really? That's almost 500,000 radical Muslims here in the United States. Here is the total of the countries that we've gone through just now. 680 million, 30,000. 680 million, 30,000 radical Muslims. And that's out of a total population in those countries of 942.4 million Muslims total. And it seems fair to assume that similar proportions of people in countries like, say, like Algeria, Syria, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Tunisia, Somalia, and Libya are also radicalized. And if they are, then, well, we're above 800 million Muslims who are radicalized. More than half the Muslims on Earth. That's not a minority. That's now a majority. And that's still not even surveying hundreds of millions of Muslims in other countries. In other words, the myth of the tiny radical Muslim minority is just that. It's a myth. And, unfortunately, it's a myth that's going to get a lot of civilized people killed. Um, we've all heard the polls that say, what, what is it, still 60, 62%? Is it still up in the 60s, I think? 62% of the American population identifies themselves in some way as Christian. You and I both know that if nearly two-thirds of the people living in this nation were actually Christian, this nation would be a completely different nation than it is. You and I both know that the actual number of born-again, redeemed, regenerated, living under the Lordship of Jesus Christ Christians in our society is a tiny fraction of that 62 or 67 percent whatever the last polls were and you and i really sit around and chuckle when these polls come out talking about what christians believe you know 54 percent of christians believe this thing that you and i just go what and of course they're throwing in the Mus the, the muslims the mormons and the jehovah's witnesses and Oneness Pentecostals, and you, you just, we, we, we've come to understand that people taking polls probably are not the most theologically adept of folks on the planet, you know? And hence, I anyways look at polls about religious belief with tremendous skepticism because I am so often misrepresented by those very polls. And I hate when people say, yeah, but Christians believe this. I don't believe that. Well, that just puts you in the minority. No, and, and that, no there's all sorts of, there are all sorts of nominal Christians. You know, you got Billy Bob hanging out in Arkansas someplace, and, well, he's a Christian because he's an American. That's just, just the way it's supposed to be. And so when they ask him about immigration or whatever, you know, I mean, now all Christians are responsible for that. And I go, ah, oh, no. That, that, th this is, th no clear-thinking person is going to go, yeah, that, that's highly relevant. There's, no, you're not going to do that. Well, I think most of you probably would agree with what I was just saying, but the article I'm looking at isn't about us. It's an article called Challenging the Tiny Minority of Extremists Myth. And it goes along with a video I saw from that uh, Ben Shapiro fellow where he was going through, basically making the argument that well over half of the world's Muslims are all radicalized. And how did he come up with that? Well, I did notice that it was based on percentages of Muslims who agreed with a certain set of statements. The most common one was that they believed in Sharia. And if you believe in Sharia, 
you're radicalized. This past Sunday, I was speaking in a church, St. Charles, Missouri, and I said to the congregation, I said, how many of you in this room believe that someday every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? How many of you believe that? Everybody puts their hand up. Well, I didn't count, but I assume there are people there. I stopped and said, you're all a bunch of radicals. You're all radicalized. I mean, if you really believe that, there will be a day when religious freedom ends by divine fiat and force. Divine fiat and force, not military fiat and force. That's one of the most important differences. We're all radicals. And from the perspective of many people writing today, they recognize that as long as you have monotheistic religions, everybody in them that takes that religion seriously is radicalized if that religion includes within it the, a final situation where God wraps everything up and makes everything right. That's considered radical. That's considered radical. Now, when you say, well, 70% of the Muslims in Nation X believe in Sharia, and that makes 70% of them radicalized. Did you ask them what they meant by Sharia? Let, let, me, let me put the shoe on the other foot again. I know some of you people do not like the fact that I'm putting the shoe on the other foot, but, you know, I saw that one guy, uh, something was posted today from one of those secret places on the internet, as if there are such secret places. And this guy says, I'm, I'm, I'm now sailing in dangerous waters. Actually, I'm just being as consistent as I've ever been. I haven't changed a licking. Um, let me put the shoe on the other foot. How many of us believe that God's law is good and just and righteous? Be careful. Be careful. What does Paul say in Romans 3? Do we do away with the law or do we establish the law? And is Paul's statement that the law is a bad thing? Or that it's a good thing, as long as it's understood properly. See, you, you can't say that God's law is a bad thing. No Christian could ever say that who has a an inkling of understanding the New Testament, which might say something right there. But we believe God's law is a good thing. But do all Christians have the same understanding of God's law? Uh, no. Don't. So... Why would you say, ah, but X percentage of Muslims believe in Sharia? Do you know what Sharia is? Do you know how many different interpretations there are of it? I mean, you know, the Taliban has got its interpretation. Uh, it's different than what you've got in Saudi Arabia. They're both barbaric and frightening, but they're not identical. They're all sorts of different interpretations of Sharia. I mean, just like we have all sorts of different interpretations. You think that maybe the guys taking the poll, you think they were experts in Sharia? And who are these Muslims that they're asking these questions of? How many of them are nominal? How many of them are truly religious, representational of the worshiping community there or just nominal because that's what you are in this country and then there was something else aside from the fact that again we would ask all these questions if we're the ones being attacked we would be asking all these questions about well how was the question phrased and who was being asked and who do you consider to be a Christian and how did you how did you filter out the nominal people and how did you filter out the people who just decided it would be fun to answer some questions for you who really don't have a clue what in the world they're talking about? Um, even though we'd ask all that stuff, I'm not seeing very many Christians asking that and you know putting the shoe on the other foot thing again. That's a bummer, but got to keep doing it. 
Because if we don't, then the same kind of argumentation is going to be used against us. And when it is, you're going to sit there sucking your thumb and have nothing to say because you weren't consistent in the first place. But then there was something else. And in fact, let me... Well, I, I could almost pick up any one of these. Um, it was toward the bottom, as I recall. Um, yeah, well, okay, like here's one. A recent poll, 70, 77% of Muslims in Denmark believe the Quran's instruction should be fully applied. If you ask Christians... Should the Bible's instructions be fully applied? What are they going to say? I mean, again, it's a poll thing. They go, well, excuse me, but could we talk about how we interpret the Bible? Could we talk about Old Covenant, New Covenant? Could, what are we? Are they going to do that? Which instructions? I mean, especially, the Bible is so much clearer. It's so much bigger and has so much more context. Which instructions? But the other thing is, what happened to the other 23%? And this is the point. There was there was one. Um, let me see here. I forget which uh which country it was. I was gonna mark this, but it was uh Basically, something along the lines of it was a an Asian country, and it said something along the lines of thirty nine percent. Maybe that'd be the way I could do it. Does this have a find function in it? That'd be something that'd be nice to have, actually. Uh, format, edit. Ah, find within note. Hey, it is there. Good. Thirty nine. Ah, okay, that one will work. 39% of Indonesians have a positive view of Hamas. Okay. Now, I think that's terrible. But doesn't it sort of prove the point that I've been trying to make the past few weeks? Uh, that means that 61% um, don't. Where, who are they? Who are these 61%? Every time you see these, you know, 16% of young Muslims in Belgium state terrorism is acceptable. That meant that 84% didn't. And all I'm hearing is of people going, oh, look at these numbers, look at these numbers. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, but none of them are 100, are they? And that means there are other people that are saying, no, no, you might, yeah, they're just doing that because they're afraid of, okay, maybe. Go ahead and double them if you want. The point is, there are people on the other side. And I still don't understand. I do not understand why so many of my brothers and sisters aren't getting this. Refuse to get, refuse to hear it. Just absolutely refuse to hear it. If you're talking to one of that percentage that doesn't, and you demand to hold them accountable for the other people's views. You're misrepresenting them, and you will never get anywhere in speaking the truth to them. Put the shoe on the other foot. A Muslim comes to you and tries to hold you accountable for Roman Catholic teaching absolutely insisting the majority of Christians in the world are Roman Catholics. They've been around the longest. You need to believe what they believe. And you go, I don't believe that they believe. And then you try to explain it. And no, no, I don't care. You don't speak for the Christian world. The Pope does. You're a minority. And this is especially true of all of us Reformed folks. We're a minority of a minority. Hello? Don't you don't you want to be held accountable for what you believe rather than what somebody else believes? And if they just insist that you actually do believe this other stuff, but you're just lying to them. 
No, we know you really believe in this. You're just lying to us. How far are they going to get with you? Not very far at all. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio back in the States. And I'm here live with Jacob Prash, who's in England. And this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings, dear friends, and greetings in Jesus. As usual, a host of international events are unfolding on the global platform of prophetic significance, pointing to the return of the Lord Jesus and the events that will precede his return. Let us begin. This week will begin in the United States, in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., Alexandria, Virginia, to be explicit, in the Islamic community of the Washington suburbs, much of it highly affluent and funded by Saudi Arabia and by other countries in the Persian Gulf. The the Obandi Islamic sect, a sect in the United States that comes from Southern Asia, has had a conference in Alexandria, Virginia this week, and has sent actually a disclosed recording shows that they were threatening the Ahmadiyya, that is the Ahmadi Muslims, uh, in the North, North Mosque in Springfield, which is of course just the Washington suburbs of Northern Virginia. Conference speakers from the Diobandi essentially threatened the Ahmadis, accusing them of trying to stop jihad and trying to stop bloodshed against the infidel, claiming, of course, that Israelis are infidels and that the United States is an infidel nation. So you have the disgusting spec uh, spectacle of the, the American government, the Justice Department and the State Department, going back to the Bush era and to the to the Clinton era and to the Obama era and now to the present day being allowed to come to the United States and carry on this kind of pro-jihadist radicalism even calling for the destruction of peaceful Muslims who do not believe in terror jihad or the shedding of blood in Amer on American soil they're allowed to come to this country or to the United States or to Britain and openly proclaim these things, taking advantage of the constitutional freedoms designed to protect the religious freedoms of America, misusing them to satiate the bloodthirsty demands of their interpretation of radical Islam, even wanting to threaten moderate Muslims. Again, something needs to be done to stop radical Islam in the United States. The Bush family knelt down and pandered to these kinds of people for too long. The Obama administration should aid and abetted these kind of people, giving them visas to come to this country or come to the United States and kill American, British, and Western citizens. And they're allowed to do it, and they're allowed to get away with it in the name of freedom and tolerance. If anybody threatened to do this to Muslims, the mainstream media would be up in arms. But when Muslims do it, even against moderate Muslims, we don't hear scarcely a word. This took place in the Virginia suburbs of Washington, D.C. The Ahmadis themselves, because they're a peaceable sect, were called infidels and not true Muslims. Let us continue this week in prophecy. It is not only in Washington, D.C. where this takes place. It is been taking place in New York. It's been taking place at the Berkeley campus in California, and it has been taking place in Boston. The Boston Islamic Seminary claims to have a mandate to train the next leader of Islam and the Islamic community in the United States. They claim that it was on that today and that their purpose is to educate the next cadre of Islamic leadership in America. Well, a group of left-wing activists in Chicago is training itself for war. It's called the Haymaker Collective, and it says that Donald Trump's election has caused a surge of fascist violence in America, and they want to establish their own anti-fascist gym to teach the left how to fight back. Nyla is a member of the Haymaker Collective and is a participant in the new gym project. It's not a real name, by the way, but a pseudonym we were given. Nyla joins us tonight. Nyla, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. So, um, I'm here to take you seriously. You're starting a gym to prepare yourself for the coming war, for the conflict. We're, what are you preparing yourself for? 
the, the conflict has already been established. We've seen since 2016 there's been a 20% increase in hate crimes, both nationally and in the city of Chicago. We know that there's certain bodies that are vulnerable to attack, that there's been an increase in racism and xenophobia, and that we feel that it's necessary for us to learn self-defense skills so rather than feeling fright frightened and isolated and alone that we can come together build strength in solidarity with one another with an autonomous gym formation look i'm for free association i'm for gyms i'm not i guess against this i just sort of wonder if your concern isn't misplaced i mean chicago is a really dangerous place i think you've had about two thousand shootings so far just this year I don't think any of them are perpetrated by right-wingers that I know of or Trump supporters, any of them. So maybe well, you've got other things to worry about. Well, according to statistics, we do have something to worry about. The Cato Institute records that the vast majority of violent extremism comes from white, right-wing, white nationalists. We uh -huh. also know that, 80, that according to statistics, 80% of deadly terrorist incidents that happen within the United States are perpetuated by people who feel that other bodies, any pe a different people, races, and religions don't belong. Right. So when I think about the threats that I'm facing, those are made up. I'm so for whatever's worth, I mean, I don't want to interrupt you, but those are totally made up statistics, and you should spend some time looking at them. But let me just ask you this: of the 2,000 shootings in Chicago, you are welcome to look at you are oh, no, welcome to look at the statistics. Okay. They're provided right. by the Cato Institute. They're also right. provided by California State University. Right. I, mean, oh, I oh, well, also have done. a number of statistics you got, you got that are provided there. by. But let me just ask you the this: the Southern Did, Poverty if, Law Center. Okay. Oh, okay. Kind of the bottom line, I guess. Um, but if we could just bring it from the national to the local. You live in Chicago, which as I just said, I think, and I think this is a correct statistic, has had about 2,000 murders just in the first seven months, less than seven months of the year. How many, uh, rather shootings, how many of those 2,000 shootings were perpetrated by right-wingers, do you think? Um, again, you can look at the Chicago Police Department. They do collect information, but we're in, we're more interested in the hate crimes that have been occurring were, were any to people of them? like myself. Okay, right, but I mean, when people are shooting each 2,000 people, okay, shot, and I don't think any of them were bias crimes against people like you, as you just put it. I don't think any of those were Trump supporters pulling the trigger. Do you know otherwise? Car Carlson, if you don't know, then I'm not going to sit here and give you statistics, but I will tell you that the stories that are making me afraid and no fearful the answer, when I take actually. the bus, no, uh -huh. when I take the bus home alone by myself on public transportation, I don't feel safe because just May 26th in Portland on the light, bright, light rail, there were two black women who were approached and confronted by a white man who calls himself a patriot. Three other white men came to those two women's defense and they were stabbed in the neck and two of them died. Right, no, no, I saw the, the story. Incident, it was an awful me? story, but 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 I'm just saying in the city that you live in, because you don't live in Portland, Oregon, you live in Chicago, Illinois. Again, I made the point, but you've had 2,000 shootings, and none of them were by Trump supporters. But that doesn't bother you. But a stabbing on a train in Portland, Oregon, is the reason you're afraid to ride the train in Chicago. It seems a little bit disassociated. Where are you on the question well, of gun Tucker, ownership? I mean, well, Tucker, here's the thing. First of all. Uh, on the question of what we're doing, we're providing a self-defense gym so that people I'm may for learn that. I mean, martial I'm not arts. That. Yep. So that then, so that people can learn martial arts, so people like me don't feel like they can't ride public transportation or right, go to their I'm houses saying, of worship I'm not without a being shrink harassed. or anything, but I'm just worried that your fears may be a little bit then, overblown. Like you've got a terrible gang problem in Chicago, but that doesn't does that scare you at all? Like if you were to go to the south well, side of Chicago, would you be worried about Trump supporters down there? Uh, Tucker, I already live on the south side, number one. Number two, I'm How many um, Trump supporters more, in your neighborhood? Quite a few. I'm sure you can look it up. But on the question of gun ownership, we can look that even how, well, owning a gun doesn't protect one. Philando Castile was a licensed gun owner, and he told yeah. that to the officer while he was shot on Facebook Live in front of his four-year-old daughter and his partner. So right. the question so, so of you don't, gun ownership you should be something that should you should be giving to the National Rifle Association as to why they're not taking Wait, can I ask some arms. Can, can I ask a question? If, if so, you're like against the system, and you think the system is rotten and racist and all that stuff, but you want only the cops and other government officials who you believe are racist to have guns? How does that work exactly, Nyla? I don't understand your question. What we're saying well, is that so there's no political Well, so if you no think America is institutionally racist, why do you think only government officials, police, National Guard, soldiers, ought to have guns? I mean, why wouldn't you want a gun, too? I don't understand well, why our, you're against private again, gun ownership if you think our country's racist. If you're bringing me on your show to talk about the project that we're starting, the project we're starting is a self-defense gym so that people can learn hand-to-hand -hand self defense I got tactics. it. It's just like guns so are more are effective than karate chops, so I'm just sort of wondering where you were on the gun thing. 
Okay, well, on the question of guns, we don't have an answer because what we're doing is starting a project with where okay. we are. And what we need to, we know is that we need to grow strength together. We have to learn okay. the responses physically to respond to some of these incidents that are happening. Okay. The question for me, again, is not on the qu uh, people sh shooting me with guns. The question is incidents like Nabra Hassanin, who was murdered while she was walking from her mosque in Washington, D.C. to a McDonald's for breakfast with a group of other teenagers. Was a she killed by a Trump supporter? Oh, oh wasn't she, she, was she I thought she was killed by an illegal alien, wasn't she? She she was killed by a man who decided to go after her with oh, a bat. Oh, yeah, and that was not a Trump teenagers. supporter, actually. That was an illegal alien. <laughs> Bad example. I'm sure there well, are others. Now, we're out of time. Unfortunately, well, it was great I to talk to I you. I don't know why. Sorry. They have, however, some very interesting professors speaking at a major campus event this week in Prophecy. One was Yahya Abdul Rahman. He is an expert in Sharia banking, and he is, has been linked to the anti-Israel websites. So he has been linked to an anti-Israel website propagating a message on intelligent anti-Semitism for Gentiles. Intelligent anti-Semitism for Gentiles. This is what it actually says. Uh, the link was to a publication called The Ugly Truth. The Ugly Truth. Another is Suhail Nahar, who issues a call to jihad and who has had links to Al-Qaeda organizations, radical Islam and its message of murder, hatred, anti-Semitism, and anti-Americanism being allowed to blossom and be propagated on American soil while the American State Department Justice Department turns a blind eye is not confined this week to the suburbs of of Washington, D.C. It's been taking place on the campus of Berkeley University. It's been taking place in Boston. It's been taking place in New York. It is on something of a rampage. We are reaping the consequences of the policies and the easy visa policies of the Bush administration, of the Clinton administration, and not least of all, if not above all, of the Obama administration. Let us pray that the Trump administration will do something to curb this abuse of freedom. It is not the freedom that the Founding Fathers envisioned in the name of freedom of religion, where people would have the right to call for the murder of other people, even of the same religion, as the murder of the Ahmadi Muslims is being called for on American soil, essentially, violence increasing against them, being urged because of their rejection of terror, bloodshed, and violent jihad. Again, this took place in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and nothing is done to stop it. If anything was ever said or done against Islam in any form by non-Muslims, the CAIR, the Council for American Islamic Relations, would issue a public outcry, and the left-wing media would be broadcasting it from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. We hear about it 24-7. But when Muslims call for the murder, even of other Muslims, for the crime of being moderate, of re rejecting violence, of rejecting anti-Semitism, of rejecting murder, of rejecting jihad, again, it's ignored by the mainstream media. And the CAIR says absolutely nothing. But let us continue looking at what has transpired this week in prophecy. The Boston Islamic Seminary claims to have a mandate to educate the next generation of Islamic leaders for the United States. They've had a series of events this week in prophecy featuring some of their professors and more recently some outside guest speakers. Among these has been Yahya Abdul Rahman, an expert on Sharia banking, that is Islamic banking. And he says that I'm sorry, and sorry. An expert on Sharia, that is Islamic banking. His website is linked to the Ugly Truth publication, which promotes quote unquote intelligent anti Semitism for Gentiles. That's what it promotes, and that's its own terminology and description. Uh, but nonetheless, that who's 
that is who is educating the next generation of Islamic leaders. He's one of the professors at the institution. Another is Suhail Lahar. Suhail Lahar issues a call to jihad in a pro Al Qaeda linked forum. Why is he allowed to do this in Boston? Is this how he? educate the next generation of Islamic leaders for American Islam. Again, it is no secret, but the Justice Department and State Department do nothing. Another is Amir el Us, who says the Jews are to blame for inter-Arab conflicts. The conflicts between Sunni and Shia, going back to the Battle of Kabbalah, going back to the 7th and 8th centuries are being blamed on the Jews. And that is what is being taught to the next generation of Islamic leaders. Guest lecturer Abdul Rahman Murphy says there's no such thing as an innocent Israeli. And again, the CAIR says absolutely nothing. But if anyone criticizes this institution, the CAIR would go on their proverbial warpath and throw their usual tantrum. A trustee of the Boston Islamic Seminary is Walid Fatahi, who calls Jews murderers. Uh, again, this is Boston. This is allowed to be taught in the United States. This is how the next generation of Islamic leaders for the American Muslim community are being trained and educated. These are their professors, their role models people who are supportive of hatred, bigotry, anti-Semitism, even terror. But it's allowed to go on. This is not, again, the idea of religious freedom that the framers of our Constitution envisioned with the preservation of freedom of religion. The freedom of religion intended constitutionally by the United States States is not the right of Muslims to come to America and to deny others, including other Muslims who are moderate, the freedoms that they are denied in the Muslim world. It is not their right to come here and proclaim a message that propagates violence and the murder of non-Muslims. Yet that's been allowed to go on. It was certainly allowed to go on by the Bush family and the Bush administration, by the Clintons and by Obama. Please, God, may a President Trump put an end to this. But let's press on. This week in Prophecy, the Grand Mufti Abdul Aziz Asheikh of Saudi Arabia has said that he is issuing a fatwa against calling for a war against the Jews a war against Israel by implication. This shows that Mohammed bin Salman is beginning to actively affect the senior leadership of the Salafis, of the Wahhab sect of Sunni Islam, dominated Saudi Arabian religious politics for four generations. Something is happening. There have also been new restrictions placed on the mutawa, on, on the religious police. And this week in prophecy, two senior Saudi officials visited a Parisian mosque in France, actually visited a mosque in Paris, sending a signal. Although other members of the senior Saudi clergy are saying there is no change in Saudi policy towards Zionism, what is being said and what is being done are two contradictory things. We see that there is some kind of change being attempted in Saudi Arabia. As we've been pointing out, the Bush administration is a broker in this rapprochement, and it very much is intertwined with joint American, Saudi, and Israeli concerns about the strategic threat posed by Iran that was aided and abetted by the Obama administration. But let's progress this week in prophecy. Back to the United States. 
the new school of social research in New York City, a well-known institution, is a conference on anti-Semitism. But poised to lead it is none other than Linda Sassler, the so-called Islamic feminist who's pro-Sharia, who's pro-suppression of women in Saudi Arabia, yet claims to be a feminist and dictates that one cannot be a feminist unless they are opposed to Zionism. In this brave new political environment is Linda Sarsour. She's a left-wing activist. She's now the face of Muslim identity politics in America. Of course, the Democratic Party loves her. But what does she actually believe? Assess it for yourself. I will respect the presidency, but I will not respect this president. Our number one and top priority is to protect and defend our communities. It is not to assimilate and to please any other people in authority. I hope that we, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad, that we are struggling against tyrants and rulers, not only abroad in the Middle East or in the other side of the world, but here in these United States of America where you have fascists and white supremacists and Islamophobes reigning in the White House. Arguing against assimilation. Why can't Democrats find a Muslim mascot who is not a total extremist? They probably could if they tried. Heat Street's Joe Simonson joins us tonight for more on this Linda Sarsour person. Joe, thanks a lot for coming on. Who thanks, is Tucker. she exactly, and is it fair to call her an extremist? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Linda Sarsour is, um, makes Muslims in the Middle East look moderate. Um, she is an extremist. Uh, and the fact that she believes in Sharia law. Um, she recently used the word jihad um, to explain her uh, personal inner war with the president. Um, she is absolutely an extremist. Um, she has taken a leadership position in the so-called leftist uh, resistance to President Trump. And um, she's certainly outside the mainstream of, uh, I think, American ideals, and I would even say the average American Muslim's ideals. Well, if she's for Sharia law, law, for sure, but that seems like it would set her at odds with mainstream feminism, which is at least purports to be about empowering women. Sharia law is, you know, a non-Western code that really circumscribes their choices. So, like, how does that work? How are feminists for Sharia law? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, uh, leftist feminists definitely have a difficult balancing act to play here. Uh, I think they really like having um, a token minority. And when she starts speaking about um, what Sharia law is, they kind of just turn off their ears. And yet, but then they can say, well, we have this woman, this Palestinian activist, and it's so great. And, oh, well, just don't listen to what it actually means to uh, live in a country that ha has Sharia law. Yeah, I mean, it seems like most people, most feminists would be adamantly right, it's against terrifying. that. Is, is it fair to say that she has ties to mainstream Democratic politicians, elected Democrats? A absolutely. I mean, not a single mainstream Democratic um, politician has certainly denounced her. She was one of the uh, people at the front of the so-called Women's March um, after Trump was inaugurated. Um, she's taken stage with several different Democratic politicians, and she's certainly been embraced by mainstream Democrats. This is not a fringe figure, even though her beliefs are certainly fringe. Huh. Where is she on Israel? Not a fan. Um, she is a Palestinian um, absolutist. Um, I would be surprised if she even believes Israel has a right to exist, Tucker. So does nobody say anything about this in the Democratic Party? I mean, it used to be, and by used to be, I mean like 18 months ago, someone like this would get some pushback in the Democratic Party. Does she? Right, absolutely. I mean, I think everyone that would criticize someone like Linus Sarsour has been driven outside of the Democratic Party. I mean, I think this is reflected in the fact that Democrats have a really hard time losing elections. Now, what I don't understand, and it's what you mentioned earlier, is that there are millions of Muslim Americans in this country that are good people, Tucker, people who assimilated, people who go to school, have normal jobs, um, who don't uh, preach Sharia law. And I don't understand why Democrats don't talk to one of these people to kind of talk about Islam. You'd think. You, I you mean, would. Yeah, they've gotten extreme. Joe, thanks a lot for that. Thanks, thanks for the Tucker. details. We appreciate it. Linda Sarsour is a Muslim political activist who co-chaired the Women's March in Washington this past January. In an interview with The Nation magazine, she said a person cannot support Israel and be a feminist because, quote, you either stand up for the rights of all women, including Palestinians, or none. What well, has several pro-Israel feminists irate, 
Big Bang Theory star Mayim Bilek, if indeed that's her name, said Wednesday that, quote, the left needs to re-examine the microscope they used to look at Israel, for sure. Comedian Roseanne Barr tweeted this, is it even possible to be a pro-Palestinian feminist? Sarsour isn't selective in her wrath, by the way. In January, she said that ex-Muslim feminist Ayan Hirsch, uh, Hirsi Ali should have her genitalia taken away from her for criticizing Islam. Notably, Ali is herself a victim of female genital mutilation. You couldn't make that up. It's too horrible. That's it for us tonight. Is growing after this Muslim activist urged people to wage jihad on the Trump administration. Watch this. I hope that we, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad, that we are struggling against tyrants and rulers, not only abroad in the Middle East or in the other side of the world, but here in these United States of America where you have fascists and white supremacists and Islamophobes reigning in the White House. Well, now she's saying that if you're angry about that, it's because you don't really know what jihad means. Here to react is Dr. Kanta Ahmed, author of In the Land of Invisible Women, and no better person to talk to us about this today. Good to have you. Thank you, Abby. I saw you watching that. I mean, you're just shaking your head because you're always on our show. You're talking about the positive things about the peaceful, loving Muslim community. What does something like this do to negatively impact people like you that are out there trying to promote it. She is tarring all Muslims with the idea that we are somehow going to combat the democratic decision of the American people. This president is rightfully and legally elected to power. She's calling us to resist that. And this is classic Islamist tactics mm. right out of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, playbook. She wants to corral the um, America's Muslims into a wedge against the major, uh, against the wider society, and she wants America to believe that we think we are a victimized religious minority when we're among the world's most privileged Muslims that there can be. Well, she talks about jihad, right? She tries to defend herself by saying, "Well, you just don't understand what jihad means. You understand what this means." No, but not everyone in that audience takes it the way she does or you do. Abby, not only does she claim that we don't know what jihad means, I'm highly literate in Islam, as are many other non-Muslims. But she's being defended by liberals who claim that we are denigrating her right to discuss Islam as a religion. That is not the case. In this climate, jihad could be uh, uh, construed by a fanatic as a call to arms to act against our president or against our structures. But what she's actually doing is is denying a profound Islamic right, a, a, a profound Islamic duty, which is our duty to society. We are called by the Quran to join and unite society, not fragment it. But the Muslim Brotherhood thrives, and Islamists thrive, by corralling all Muslims into believing that we're victimized and that we're persecuted, and then claiming rights as a religious minority when really she's acting as a political totalitarian ideologue. Well, it sounds like she might have political ambitions of her own. Here's what she tweeted in her defense, Dr. Ahmed. She says, we will define our religion on the terms of the majority of Muslims. Learn from the experts. Reading is fundamental. What message do you have to her this morning? So actually, I take my insights about Islamism and the Muslim Brotherhood from the Muslim world. The most recent example is the state of Egypt, where Egypt's people overwhelmingly removed these kinds of ideologues from power in Mohammed Mercy. That is believing Muslims in the order of almost 90 million Muslims opposing the Muslim Brotherhood strategies in Egypt in a Muslim country. This is what she's trying to bring here. Liberals that fall for this are not only being uh, profoundly ignorant, they're imp empowering an, I, a, a woman that would seek to dismantle our democratic order. That is not in the benefit of of, of Muslims like me, many of us who can call her out and see what her hypocrisy is about. Good to have you with us tonight. Martha, thank you very much for having me. What is your reaction when you look at, I know you've read the text of that and everybody at home just read it as well. What's your reaction? My reaction is that Ms. Sarsu is hostile to me, not because she knows me, but because she's a fake feminist. Ms. Sarsu is not interested in universal human rights. She's a defender of Sharia law and the principle of Sharia law. There's no principle that demeans, degrades, and dehumanizes women more than the principle of Sharia law. 
And Linda Sarsu is a defender of that. She hates me, she hates Brigitte Gabriel because of that. And I want to say, I want to ask Linda Sarsu and the women who put their trust in her, why did she not organize a march for Asiya Bibi? That's the woman in Pakistan who's on death row. She is condemned because allegedly she did something that caused her to blaspheme or Miriam Ibrahim in Sudan, who was imprisoned. The 270 plus women that were kidnapped in Boko Haram, the Yazidi women who were subjected to slavery by ISIS. This is the times we live in on these fake feminists who say they speak for Muslim women. They have never said anything about this. Linda Sarsu is not a defender of universal human rights. She's a defender of Sharia law. She hates me because I expose what Sharia law is. What Sharia law is, is what the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria is doing. I mean, you have been a victim uh, of genital mutilation. She has made statements that are widely interpreted to be not simply anti-Zionist, but anti-Semitic. Yet in very liberal and very Jewish New York, She's being allowed in the new school of social research to lead a panel that is addressing the issue of autism. This is absurd. As we've been warning for some time, this week in prophecy, these wild birds of prey are coming home to roost. We've spoke repeatedly of the self-destructive foolishness of a voting majority of American Jews who supported the Democratic Party and who pandered to the left. Many of them, leaders of the left themselves, who are now reaping what they sowed and who are harvesting the consequences of their own stupidity. At least Alan Dershowitz admitted he was naive in his trusting and believing Barack Obama concerning his policies regarding Israel. Some members of President Obama's own party now outraged over his refusal to back America's greatest ally, Israel, in Friday's vote at the U.N. Our next guest is one of them. He says Donald Trump did the right thing by stepping in and trying to stop all this. Attorney Alan Dershowitz is a professor emeritus at Harvard Law School. He joins us now live. Good to see you. Um, I wonder what you think was really behind this, because Prime Minister Netanyahu has never had a good relationship with President Obama. It seems like President Obama wanted to stick it to him. Well, that's not the way policy should be made, to get even in the lame duck period when there are no checks and balances and you don't have to worry about any election. It's the most undemocratic thing a president can do to tie the hands of his successor during the lame duck period. And what he did was so nasty, he pulled a bait and switch. He said to the American public, oh, this is all about the settlements deep in the West Bank. And yet he allowed his representative to the U.N. to abstain, which is really right. for a resolution that says the Jews can't pray at the Western Wall. Right. Jewish and Arab settlements. students can't go to Hebrew University. Jewish and Arab patients can't go to Hadassah Hospital. Jews can't live in the Jewish quarter where they've lived for thousands of years. And he's going to say, whoops. I didn't mean that. Well, read the resolution. You're a lawyer. You went to Harvard Law School. Read what you've read. So why did President Obama do this then? Well, I think he was just trying to get even. Look, he called me into the Oval Office before the election, and he said mm -hmm. to me, Alan, I want your support, and I have to tell you, I will always have Israel's back. I didn't realize what he meant is that he would have his back to stab them in the back. Mm -hmm. And he just stabbed them in the back. And this will make peace much more difficult to achieve because the Palestinians will now say, we can get a state through the UN, we can get a state through the BDS movement, because this will encourage mm -hmm. that. We can get a state through the International Criminal Court, because this will encourage that. We don't have to negotiate, we don't have to make painful compromises. He will go down in history, President Obama, as one of the worst foreign policy presidents ever. What he did to Syria, and what he did and was partly responsible for what happened in Aleppo, creating a vacuum for Russia, I have to tell you, you know, look, I supported his domestic yeah. policy. I liked him on Supreme mm -hmm. Court appointments. But he created a terrible conflict for people, many like me, liberal Democrats, who support his domestic policy but think he was an appalling, appalling 
Wow. President, when it came to foreign Strong policy. Strong words. So many things Hurt I want to America follow up on. so badly. So many I want to follow up on. One on Syria. So why did President Obama focus on stabbing Israel in the back, as you say, uh, and the U.N. focus on this instead of Syria? Hundreds of thousands are being slaughtered, and they're not focused on that. Well, there were more resolutions condemning Israel than all the other countries in the world combined, including North Korea, Syria, you name it. China, look at the people who voted for this resolution. China, which has been occupying Tibet. Russia, which has been occupying the Ukraine and, and Konigsberg. New Zealand, which is basically a colonial country established by settlers coming in, killing the Maoris, expelling them, ethnic cleansing, and creating their own country. What hypocrisy. So take your crystal ball out, and let's try to get something positive out of this, which is Israeli-Palestinian peace. What are the prospects? Is it that now President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu may just go more hardline because of this, and there's a less chance of peace? Or is there a chance here, when President-elect Trump takes office, uh, some glimmer of hope. Well, there is some glimmer of hope, but you can't undo a UN resolution because you can't take back an abstention. Once the United States didn't veto, that's it forever. So the president has deliberately tied the hands of his successor. It's going to make it much harder for President Trump to bring about peace, but I think he wants to see a negotiated peace. Look, you have two tough guys, mm -hmm. Netanyahu and Trump. They'd both love to be Nixon in China. They'd both love to be the guys who made peace and did it on Israel's terms mm -hmm. with good security, protecting Israel. So I'm always an optimist. You know, in Israel, uh, a pessimist is one who says things are so bad they can't get any worse. An optimist is one who says, yes, they can. <laughs> Sobering so, stuff. I wanted to talk to you about the Brooklyn Dodgers. You just wrote a book oh about boy. Jackie Robinson. You grew up four <laughs> blocks from Ebbets Field. Right. We're going to get to that another day. Uh, very interesting talk. Tough talk for President Obama. Very interesting words from you. Thank you. We so appreciate much. you coming in. When Obama told him he had Israel's back, and to quote Mr. Dershowitz, Mr. Obama gave it to Israel in the back. This week in prophecy, something has happened. The student newspaper at the University of Berkeley, California, published an article attacking Mr. Dershowitz, accusing him of having blood on his hands and of perpetuating atrocities because he is not anti-Zionist. He was refused the right to publish a responsive article in his own defense, refused the right. Again, we are seeing the beginning of the liberal American Jewish community reaping the fruits of its own naive stupidity. This delusional notion that you can make peace with fundamentalist Islam or the ultra left, with so many, so many, Jews being involved in the ultra left. They are like the man who owns the Rottweiler until the Rottweiler turns on them. Once they are no longer of any practical use or advantage to those who have used them and manipulated them, their friends on the left and in the Islamic community will turn against them and are already doing so. Mr. Dershowitz is only the first of many to come. This has been taking place this week in Prophecy at the New School of Social Research in New York City and at Berkeley University in California. This week in Prophecy. American Jews, watch out. You voted left. You've gone left. You've championed the cause of the left. You're following left-wing Jews like George Soros and you will reap what you have sowed. This is only the beginning. Let us continue looking at what else has transpired this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy has also seen a new poll published by Hayom newspaper. The poll issued questionaries to the Arab population of Israel. 60% of Israeli Arabs, 60% have stated that they are proud, proud to be Israelis. This does not only include Druzies and Arab Christians, it includes the majority of Israeli Muslims. A solid majority of Israeli Arabs have also said that they accept the legitimacy of the Jewish state of Israel as a Jewish state. Again, the standard of living held by Arabs in Israel is much higher than the standard of living 
held by Arabs in most Arab countries, as is the standard of personal freedom, education, longevity, low infant mortality, social benefits, human rights, etc. This is more so true for Arab Christians who are persecuted in one Islamic country after another. This week in prophecy. Let's continue. This week in prophecy, the Israeli Ministry of Interior, Interior Minister Arya Debi, Deri, sorry, the Interior Ministry Arya Deri, acting <laughs> on the advice of the Public Security Minister Gilead uh, Erdan, has blocked egg trial by 20 European lawmakers from the European left who are pro disinvestment in Israel and of the boycott of the Israeli economy and elements of the Israeli economy. The entry of 20 were blocked on the grounds that they were coming to meet specifically with the convicted Islamic terrorist, Mawan Bagoti. We salute the Israelis for not allowing these people into Israel. They are doing the correct thing. The problem we have is what the Israelis are doing should also be done by the United States and by Great Britain and by other countries. If anyone panders to or collaborates with Islamic terror, they should be denied visa entry, even if they are parliamentarians. Again, we have no demand for boycott or disinvestment of the Islamic countries who are engaged in the genocidal slaughter of Christians or the grossest of human rights violations. None! But when it comes to Israel defending itself from militant Islamic aggression, the world is supposed to be up in arms. It was this week in prophecy. The Israelis have finally begun to react. It's been a long time coming. It is our hope that the Americans and British governments follow suit. But let's continue. This is weak in prophecy. In Germany, murder charges were launched against someone identified as Ahmad A, a Palestinian who stabbed and murdered in Hamburg. This comes on the heels of the breakdown in coalition talks of the Angela Merkel government and her coalition partners and others within her own party. Even as German women were being sexually molested openly publicly on the streets by Islamic refugees whom she invited in, demanding that a further million be brought into Germany, this has caused a political rift within Germany and within her own party. It is difficult to understand the rationale that is governing Angela Merkel, or for that matter, the government of France, in light of the terrorist attacks these countries have themselves suffered. The British government this week announced that it is purchasing Iron Dome technology from Israel to defend the Falkland Islands in the South Atlantic. It's the first major defense contract between the British government and the Israelis in over 10 years. There have been smaller contracts, but this is the first major one. The Iron Dome technology that protects Israel from Katusha rockets launched by Hamas and by Hezbollah and other Islamic radicals from Lebanon and from the Gaza Strip is now being modified for use in the Falklands by the British government under a contract with the Israelis. That contract was announced this week in prophecy. Also this week in prophecy, the Taylor Force Act was voted for by the House and approved. It now will go on to the Senate. The weakness of the Taylor Force Act is it makes the U.S. State Department the primary agency responsible for compliance of the Palestinian Authority with American guidelines to stop supporting Islamic terror. Now again, rightly, and constitutionally, that is the function of the State Department. The State Department has until now, under previous administrations, been reluctant to speak out about the pro-terrorist policies of the Abbas regime and of the Palestinian Authority. It is a good first step, however. It is named after an American military personnel, an American military serviceman, 
who was killed uh, while visiting Israel. And it would curtail U.S. taxpayer funding to the Palestinian Authority if they did not comply with the American demands that they stop funding radical Islamic causes. Politics will likely be played with this if it is enacted into full law, but it is a step forward, and it will be a good law if it is properly enforced as it is intended to be. This week in prophecy, suicide bombing attacks, Muslim against Muslim, are continuing. They are continuing in Iraq. Following the removal of the Kurds, we had a serious attack in a small town in northern Iraq this week, killing 30 people within the last day. More of these are likely to continue. The Kurds were a stabilizing force against ISIS. With the Kurds gone, you will have a standoff between the inept Iraq government and the collapsing ISIS who are desperate in fighting for their very survival. Again, it was a colossal mistake, a mistake of colossal proportions for the Western governments not to show sympathy to the Kurds. Uh, fear of alienating Turkey is not something that is going to change the equation in any meaningful way. The Erdogan government is dragging Turkey in such a direction as it will not make a difference no matter what the Western governments do. To say nothing of Iran, who also is opposed to any uh, incipient form of Kurdish nationalism. This is beginning to change, and it's beginning to change for the worse. We've said repeatedly, the only people in Iraq we can truly trust to any degree are the Kurds. They're the only ones who can bring a stability to northern Iraq, whether the Turks and Iranians like it or not. But a vacuum is being recreated, much the same as the vacuum was created by the Obama administration, which ISIS filled. Now, with the defeat of ISIS, another vacuum is being created. The Turks don't like the Kurds, but the Kurds are the only ones who can fill that vacuum in a way that is in the interests of the West. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, once more, the federal court system has overstepped its constitutional bounds. The president as commander in chief made a military decision based on medical advice concerning transgender troops in the military, citing the astronomical cost of providing health care for such people that would be passed on to the American taxpayer. A left-wing judge has outlawed the president's decision. Again, we do not blame anybody other than Congress for not impeaching these federal judges and removing them from the bench. Legislating from the bench ought to be an impeachable offense automatically. Violating the separation of powers should automatically be an impeachable offense. There are members of the U.S. Supreme Court, there are members of the third, sixth, and ninth federal appellate courts who need to be impeached and removed by Congress. The number one threat domestically to American freedom is the out-of-control judiciary. Not just the Southern Poverty Law Center or the ACLU, who are indeed a threat to our constitutional liberties, but to the left-wing judges appointed not only by the Clintons or by Obama, but appointed by Ronald Reagan and appointed by the Bush dynasty. We have warned of this repeatedly. It is indeed interesting that despite the allegations from nearly 40 years ago against Judge Moore in Alabama, more recent polls show that he is still ahead, howbeit by a reduced margin, in the Senate race in Alabama. It would be a slap to the face of the Republican Party establishment if he were to win. Unless he can be proven guilty, there is no reason for him to be removed as candidate except the political concern 
that he might not be able to win. But the idea that the left-wing media can dig something up that is an allegation, unproven, from 40 years ago, from women who have surreptitious motives in some of these cases. The question arising, why did they never bring it up when he was a candidate for governor? Or when he was in the judiciary, why do they only bring it up now some 40 years later? It is very suspicious. Yet when Bill Clinton was proved, proven publicly, to be not only guilty of sexual malconduct, but when he was disbarred for perjury for lying about it, the left-wing media had no problem. It is all corruption and hypocrisy. If Judge Moore is innocent, and if this is simply a politically orchestrated assassination of his reputation to keep him from becoming U.S. Senator, I pray that he becomes the next U.S. Senator. But this does disclose the horrific, horrific hypocrisy of Mitch McConnell and the Republican Party establishment and the leadership they have in Washington. As we've been saying all along, Mr. Trump's agenda has an opponent not simply in the Democratic Party establishment led by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, but his biggest enemies are Mr. Ryan and Mr. McConnell. They are no better. In fact, they are no different. Judge Moore beat the system in gaining the nomination as a senatorial candidate. Ronald Reagan beat the system. He beat the Republican Party establishment. Unless he is actually guilty, unrepentantly guilty of what he did, allegedly did, I hope and pray that Judge Moore continues to beat the system. It is a threat to democracy when the left can selectively target people who have never been convicted or proven guilty. We see one left after another having the carpet pulled out from under them. It began with Harvey Weinstein and then Kevin Spacey. Justice finally comes to Hollywood. Now it is Congressman John Conyers. But nobody's calling for him to resign. And he actually admitted his guilt and paid money in a settlement. There are two standards in the hypocrisy of Washington. Again, I believe there is a spiritual battle over the destiny of the United States and Great Britain politically. There's more to these things than the usual Washington corruption and scandals. There's an attack on freedom, on democracy. There is a conflict in the heavenlies that is reflected in the conflict on the earth. I am convinced that Judge Moore is a Bible-believing Christian. He stood up for the Ten Commandments against our corrupt Supreme Court that tried to make itself, that tried to deify itself as the supreme being. Again, the blame is with Congress for not impeaching the Supreme Court justices, such as Sandra Day O'Connor, appointed by Ronald Reagan, the pro-abortion Sandra Day O'Connor, after Ronald Reagan lied to Christian America that he was pro-life. But let us continue this week in prophecy. These scandals are seeing many heads roll in the media. Charlie Rose has been fired by at least two major networks. Again, a left-wing figure in mainstream media as an interviewer. Uh, Kevin Spacey is now under investigation for criminal activities involving sexual predatory allegations in the United Kingdom, here in Great Britain. He is the director of the Vic Theatre, uh, a prestigious and venerable British institution that has had him as director for some years, but now the question becomes, what will become of his career? It's happening in Hollywood. I hope it happens in Washington. Why is the media focused on Judge Moore instead of on Conyers? Judge Moore has never been proved guilty. Conyers has been forced to admit it. And so it continues this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy here in the United Kingdom. The British government announced this week 
that 60%, 60% of Muslim marriages in Great Britain are illegal. 60%. We're not simply talking about bigamy and polygamy. We're talking about the forced marriage of underage girls and various other violations of human rights and of women's rights. Six out of ten Muslim marriages in Great Britain are illegal. Without doubt, the Bush, Obama, and Clinton administrations would have liked to see that become a reality in the United States. We see in New Jersey with the appointment by Chris Christie of an Islamic judge who had fundamentalist ties. Uh, it's not about Democrat and Republican. Both parties will sell America down the river to fundamentalist Islam and even to radical Islam. Both parties will. We need people who will stand up and speak out. In Britain, it has reached 60% of Muslim marriages are illegal. This week in prophecy, the Clinton Library has refused to release to judicial investigators records of Bill Clinton's associations with the billionaire pedophile Epstein. We know that on these five occasions, Mr. Clinton ditched his Secret Service bodyguards and took flights on these planes <coughs> that eyewitness testimony said orgy-type activities with underage girls were taking place, flying down to Mr. Epstein's private island in the Virgin Islands, where sex orgy parties were taking place, again, involving pedophilia with underage girls. What? was Bill Clinton doing on those flights five times, ditching his Secret Service escorts to go down there with this man. But the Clinton Library won't even release any records concerning it. Why? Epstein was convicted. Clinton was disbarred for perjury. Conyers has admitted the payoff and the settlement and the culpability. But the media has to focus on Judge Moore, who's never been convicted. Again, we've said this enough times, but it's happening this week in prophecy. At, at least, at least, justice is beginning to play out in the eyes of the public, despite the efforts of the mainstream media to manage the news instead of to report it. Let's continue. This week in prophecy, the British government has enacted a new policy with full legal backing to allow for the monitoring of 20,000, 20,000 British Muslims or Muslims in the UK with radical ties. 20,000 can now be monitored by Special Branch and MI5, British Counterintelligence. 20,000. When you have Thousands and thousands. How did that happen? It happened by open immigration policies and by the public being sold the lie that fundamentalist Islam is a religion of peace and tolerance when they cannot show you a single Sharia country that is a democracy in the Western sense or where Christians and Muslims, uh, Christians and Jews have the same rights that Muslims receive in the United Kingdom or in other Western countries, including the USA. 20,000. What did it take for the British government to finally come to terms with this reality? Four major terrorist attacks emanating from Muslims within the UK. That is what has jolted Britain. What will it take to jolt the United States? when the Clinton State Department and the Obama administration allowed the San Bernardino murderer to come into the country and would not look at plain material that was indicative of their disposition towards violence that was in social media because we didn't want to violate their rights. If something's in social media, it's not protected. You don't need a warrant to access it. And even if you did, they should have obtained a FISA warrant to do so. But the Obama administration is interested in protecting Islamic sensitivities than in American lives. Well, these realities have reached an apex of Britain with these attacks. We pray to God that the American government will follow suit. 
before it is too late and more people die. That's what took place this week in prophecy. This week, reports from Israel are now showing reality of Orthodox Jewish soldiers serving in the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF. They are increasingly victims of violence from within the Orthodox community. Orthodox Jewish soldiers going home on leave or on weekend passes are exempt from having to wear their uniforms for fear of being attacked by other Orthodox Jews. For too long, the policies of the Israeli government, going back to the time of Ben-Gurion's coalition with the National Religious Party, have given religious exemptions to Orthodox Jews, where they would sit in yeshivas and be paid for sitting in yeshivas, while Jews, better and braver than themselves, went to war to protect them. But now that more Orthodox Jews are serving in the military, they're being violently attacked by Orthodox Jewish gangs. These riots have spread from Jerusalem now to B'nai Brak in the outskirts of Tel Aviv, an ultra-Orthodox community. The spectacle of religious Jewish soldiers being attacked by religious Jews for being soldiers, for protecting Israel, even for protecting the religious themselves, displays the hypocrisy of Talmudic Judaism for what it is. As we have said repeatedly, it is not Judaism, it is Rabbinism. There is nothing in the teaching of the Torah that would indicate a religious Jewish soldier should be the victim of gang violence for being a soldier, for defending his home and his family. But that is what has taken place in Israel this week in prophecy. We see these events transpiring. They are happening in the United States. They're happening in Great Britain. They're happening in Israel. And they will continue to happen with increased frequency. But understand this, they all point to one thing. They point to the one thing we highlight every week. The stage is being set for the return of Hashiach Yeshua Adonai, the Lord Jesus, will return as the true Messiah of Israel and the King of the Jews. Please pray for President Trump and Mr. Pence and their government. Please pray for Mr. Netanyahu and the government of Israel. Please pray for the protection of allied forces in Iran, Iraq, and for the IDF. And please pray for moderate Islam and moderate Muslims like the Ahmadi. These people are open to reason. They're not violent. We can talk to them. Pray that there will be an outpouring of God's Spirit upon them. At our conference in England last weekend, when Tim Worth was with me, I had the blessing and privilege of having lunch with a young man from Afghanistan who had been a Muslim from that country, who simply by reading the Judeo-Christian scriptures came to see the truth about the Lord Jesus and was born again. I assure everyone, my hostility is against militant Islam. It is not against Muslim people. You will not find a better believer in the Lord Jesus than somebody who was truly saved out of Islam and became a born-again follower of Yeshua HaMasiyah of Jesus Christ. Likewise, the faithful remnant of Israel. I've had the blessing and privilege of knowing so many Jews, including Orthodox Jews, who have come to a saving faith in Jesus. I have known so many people from Roman Catholic backgrounds coming to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus. You know, the World Council of Churches has seen one of its leaders banned from entering Israel because of their pro-boycott and disinvestment activities being carried on in the name of the Christian faith. This was Isabel Fieri. She's banned from entering Israel. The World Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches does not represent true Christianity. The Orthodox Jews beating up Jewish soldiers for being soldiers does not represent real Judaism. Unfortunately, militant Muslims calling for the murder of other Muslims or moderate 
do represent true Islam. They simply quote directly from the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad. When they say things like, these people are perverting Islam, this is radical Islam, this is extremist Islam. No, it's not. Their claim is, it is just Islam. And they go to the Islamic scriptures to support their position of violence and murder. We need to pray for moderate Muslims, for people like the Ahmadi sect and others who don't want to murder, who don't want jihad, who don't want to force Sharia on other people, who want to live and coexist peaceably, to find a peaceful solution to problems. Well, the ultimate peaceable solution will come when all people, whether they profess to be Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, come to a saving faith and the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Jacob Pash. This has been This Week in Prophecy. Thank you so much for listening. Please watch our other biblical expositions on Moriel TV. God bless. Thank you, Tim.